It is great to have with us Cubs manager David Ross. Rossi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Lan? Good to see you, buddy. Same here. We've talked in the past about some of your influences. You you played for so many great managers, so I'd be curious to to hear some of those names in terms of influences on you as you look ahead uh, to this job, and not just managers, but maybe former teammates as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, obviously Joe here at the end of my career, uh, who just left, I have a ton of respect for him, winning uh, under him and, and being a part of that atmosphere that, that he creates. Um, he, he believes a lot of the things that I believed as a player he put into place as a manager. And so um, finding that, that line between him and, and another one I, I compare him to and, and, and vice versa is Bobby Cox. I played for Bobby uh, probably as a reputation, probably a little more old school uh, than Joe. Joe used a little bit more of the information, but really similar in the way they handled players uh, and went about their business of watching the game. I think Joe, Joe's a little more old school at heart uh, than a lot of people uh, would believe if you really talk baseball with him. He believes in, in the core values that I, I believe in. Bobby Cox was the same way. Treat people the right way. Um, you know, trusting in the players, um, making the right decision for the group, treating everybody the same, giving the players a lot of freedom um, to go out there and play. Uh, both those guys stood out to me. And then, you know, early on, I've played for a lot of great John Farrell, one of, one of, and Tori Lovello, who's a great manager now in Arizona, was our bench coach in Boston, got a ton of respect for. And then I go back to as a rookie and, and Jim Tracy in L.A. and the kind of the small ball game that we played out there uh, with our great pitching staff. And, and so I've got a little bit of that influence on me uh, as well. And what about some former teammates? You know, when you, when you came up, you played with some veteran guys who probably felt like your manager at the time. Uh, and then as you became a veteran guy, I'm sure you became really good friends with some guys who had managerial aspirations. Yeah, I look back and now, like, former managers on some of my early teams, the Dodgers, Alex Cora was there, Dave Roberts uh, is a huge influence in my life, uh, just on and off the field. Uh, and in my family life, he's such a, a good quality human being. He took me under his shoulders, uh, under his, you know, put me under his wing and, and uh, early on in my career. And then to play with Ron Ventura, who got a chance to, to manage the White Sox. Uh, and we're, we're pretty close. Um, and then, you know, I get it to, to Atlanta and, and, and Brian McCann. Uh, I was going through a transition for me of, of being a guy who wanted to start and really backing up an all-star and um, really just, how he spoke positively in every situation. And, and I, I realized how that made me feel uh, personally and then tried to ask myself why I didn't do that, do that for others more. Um, you know, all those things were, um, were influenced on my life. I'm probably missing out on a, on a ton of guys that, that uh, impacted me and, and my career, but those are the first ones that come, come to mind. Absolutely. Uh, now let's look back at your Cubs career. Wasn't that long, but you're a Cub for life for a very good reason. Um, did you see this team going from where it started when you got here to becoming the World Series champion at the end of your career, which was less than two years later? Uh, I, well, I don't know that you ever foresee that, right? But, I mean, obviously you, you recognize the talent. I remember my first spring training here uh, in 15 and, and the young talent that was on the field and, and the guys, the at-bats. Um, and really that, that kind of turning point, I remember the, the San Francisco series when they came in and we swept them in 15 at Wrigley. And I was like, whoa, this, you know, we, we kind of took off from that point. Um, and, and we had such a good mix of, of veterans and um, a, a youth. And then the following year and the move they made and going out and getting some key pieces with the Zobrist and, uh, bringing Dex back, uh, John Lackey gets no love. Uh, I don't think publicly and in the big scheme of things because of um, coming in for that one year. But I, I thought he was a guy we, we lacked a little bit of edge for me in '15. Even after all we did, we didn't have that that, that kind of edge, and he he brought that for sure to us. And, and there's so many so many pieces that got to kind of fall in place uh, along the way. But uh, you definitely saw. It was a hunger after 15 and saw the potential uh, when things were clicking and then walking into spring training in 16 and having that target and, uh, and Joe's mantra of embracing that and, and really, um, you know, being the team that's, that's supposed to win it all and, and going out and doing it, I think it's a much, much tougher task than people give it credit for. Yeah, and of all the things that you mentioned, you know, I think another thing that kind of gets forgotten is about the 30-start stretch Jake Arrieta had between 15 and 16. You caught uh, one of his no-hitters. 
Uh, the, the story I like to tell before his second start in 16, we were in Arizona and uh, walked into the Starbucks across the street on the Sunday. And I said, how you doing, Jake? He goes, I'm just going to dominate some people today. And he went out, and I think, through eight innings and hit a 425-foot home run. But uh, what was that like to not only catch Jake, but even the times you didn't, just to watch him absolutely dominate people? Yeah, well, a, a lot of people um... – don't realize in 14 I was in Boston and the Cubs came in and kicked our butt and so um I remember I played the game where he had that no hitter going it going into the to the eighth or ninth I believe it was really late and he was carving and I played that game and there's some I was one of the more dominant um I don't you don't feel dominated in the box I wasn't a great hitter and I got myself out but I always thought it was my fault when when I was facing Jake you're like whoa this guy's a horse he's a number one and so that was just that alone that game uh, help make me the, the help me make the decision to come to Chicago and follow Johnny Lester because now I've, I knew we had two aces and Johnny and and Jake so um, yeah man Jake's one of my favorite teammates all time the guy is has so much respect around the game from his teammates and the guys that played with him um, he you know for me catching everybody talks about my, my game seven home run is this highlight I had so many other great highlights and then one of them was Jake of that year and one of them was Jake Arietta's uh, me catching that no hitter and uh, I try to pride myself on game calling and defense but he walked me through that whole whole no hitter he had already been there before uh, in LA shortly so uh, he was shaking me off and going to what he what he felt good good with and his strengths and um, that I, I, I that's a highlight for sure of my moment and then um, you know when you look back on the the whole of that season for him and and uh, what he was able to do in, in, in 15 and 16. Uh, but, but that second half he had, I go back to Chris Medlin was the only guy that had kind of a better second half. Uh, and I was in Atlanta up until that point and Jake just dominated his numbers, uh, from the ones I had been with, with Chris. So, um, it was fun to watch and it was total domination. And, and we went into, uh, Pittsburgh for that wild card game. I remember, uh, you know, all the fans talking trash and he was backing it up and I'm like, man, but to go out there and back that up and have that that sense of confidence and poise in that moment uh, just stood out to me of what a what a beast he is on the mound and uh, how he keeps his composure and goes out and does exactly what he knows he's going to do. Uh, so many great memories from uh, those two years for sure. Um, let's briefly talk about the interim period. You retire as a player before you become a manager. Uh, you're doing some front office work for the Cubs. You're doing some broadcasting for ESPN. And you got to see the game from what Theo calls the 30,000-foot view. It's really weird, I'm sure, at first for not only a, a former player but a former catcher who is in the middle of the action. Game looks a lot easier upstairs, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. You know, I, I'm so thankful for those opportunities um, that I got to do after, after my career was over and, and still keep a foot in, you know, obviously being around the team was, was so impactful for me and, and, um, building relationships in the front office with that group, R and D all the way down to scouts and being in the draft and, uh, getting to watch that was super cool to me and, and, a, and a kind of a baseball guy. And then talking about it on TV, obviously is super fun and being on that ESPN, uh, group, but it is a lot different. And that passion for the daily, um, justification or uh, whatever it is that that the word I'm looking for that just kind of makes you feel whole uh, in competition I was missing a little bit you know um, without being in that dugout I just remember sitting um, in a playoff game in Washington and seven was at 17 and and I'm sitting out there with Theo and Jay Mack and and Jed and sitting behind home plate and I wanted to know what the scouting report was. I wanted to call every pitch. I wanted to be in that dugout next to the guys and, and be somebody, be a cheerleader on the bench. I just, um, my heart, uh, everything, all my whole being wanted to be in that dugout. And so that just stood with me as much as, as much as I love the TV stuff and talking baseball and especially the little league world series and all the cool things I got to do for ESPN. Um, when you're done with a game, it's like, Oh, uh, was it a good game or a bad game? I don't know what kind of game I actually had. Um, and so you, you get a, you get a little bit of, of like, okay, I guess that my job's over. I go home. And so there's something powerful about, um, uh, uh, being able to criticize yourself whether you had a good game or a bad game or, or, uh, baseball gives us that uh, immediately, whether we win or lose and, and, and through our stats when we're playing. A shortened season, every game kind of counts double. How would that change the way you might manage? We, we got to come out of the gates 
sharp and, and some of these teams that, that start playing well right away, uh, hopefully that's us, um, are going to have a huge advantage and in, in, in a short season. And so it, there's, a, there's a fine line between getting off to a good start and also bringing guys along to make sure they're healthy because um, our depth, uh, we, we, we don't have a, a ton of depth in certain areas. So uh, we've got to walk that line, but yet still push forward and compete uh, with, with all we have. Um, and then, you know, as, a, as just the games go, I'm a guy who likes to see if guys settle into the season, what their at-bats look like, give them a little bit of leash. You know, good managers I've been around are, are patient and, and let guys, you know, kind of, you know, sometimes Riz gets off to a, a rough first month and, 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 you know, you can't panic in that. Um, that's with every player. Every player has good months and bad months. Uh, but I think as a, as a manager now in a short season, you got to have a little bit less of a leash that you're going to give these guys and really use your eyeballs to tell you, uh, who's who's having good at bats? Who's squaring the ball up? Uh, who's playing the game the way you want it to be played, and and how you think you're going to win uh, each and every night? And so, um, as much as I've dove in uh, to the information and try to surround myself with as mu much information as I can in a shortened season, it's going to be a little bit hard to trust uh, smaller uh, sample sizes and numbers. So, uh, really using our eyeballs, talking to the coaching staff getting feedback from the players. Um, I, I really feel like it's a, a total group of, of how we're going to have to go about this and attack it. Last question. This is the big picture one that's, uh, I think, fun to answer and sometimes hard to necessarily verbalize. What does it mean to you to be a Chicago Cub and wear that big red C on your chest that uh, Ernie Banks and Fergie Jenkins and all the great Hall of Famers once wore and Joe Madden wore and John Lester wears and uh, David Ross wears once again. Yeah, I mean, for me, that if I had to find a word that encompasses the Cubs and what it means to me, it, it's it's family. Um, it's it's a uh, it's from the top down. It's run by family. Um, our front office, uh, I consider family. We you work together, you grind together. Everybody's on the same uh, page and and after the same goal. Everybody uh, succeeds if we win. Everybody um, continues to to keep their jobs and is in a good place if we continue to win. And um, just the one thing I know about this group and being in those meetings in, in the downtime is they care about character. They care about personalities, how guys are carrying themselves as well as talent. So, um, yeah, if I had to sum it up in one word, it, you know, this organization's family to me. I, I, I care so much. You interact with these people every day, uh, yourself included. When you see uh, you and Jim, you see these guys around the clubhouse and around the field. It just we're, – we're all after the same thing. And um, that kind of unified – um, connection is what brought me back to baseball. I want to be connected with a, a group of men and try to lead them to do something historic and special as we've done before, because uh, those are the special moments in life. I don't have any other agenda uh, than that. Rossi, thanks so much for the time. We look forward to a great year. Of course, Lynn, always, man. Good to see you. That's David Ross, Chicago Cubs manager.